Okay. Well, since I am not really coming from outside, uh, most of you have already seen me hopefully and some of you are in my class. So, basically that introduction tells you what type of background I have and what I am up to. And what I am going to talk about today, this is something I do for my own research. I will talk about something that we have been working on for several years, many years now. And it involved collaboration from lot of people, my students in India, my collaborators in many other countries and so on and so forth. All right. What I am going to present today is a very simple metallurgical problem. All of you are aware of it. It is a very, very conventional thing in metallurgy. But the way I will try to present a solution that is not so conventional, that is totally different, totally out of the usual kind of approaches and that is fully computational where I try to do some computation and try to see uh, my performance against some experimental data. That is the whole approach. Now, let us see what are the things that you know here and what you do not know here. You know this, this is GIFT okay? uh, and you all know it is a very conventional age old technique that steel companies all over the world, they require to protect their steel for certain type of steel, not a type of steel, they galvanize it, they put some coatings and zinc is a very common material. All right. Now, other than that, there is this word optimized. You might have seen that used everywhere quite casually, but I am going to use that in a very, very mathematical sense. All right. And then these are the things, genetic and evolutionary algorithms. These are some very special different types of computing technique that me, all my students and all my collaborators work on. And this is what I am teaching here currently as some of you who are in my class, you know that. All right. I will talk about some of the details here. All the details will not be possible to you know uh, really tell you in this kind of brief seminar. But one thing should be there that this was genetic and evolutionary algorithms, it has a special meaning. The name comes because we try to compute some engineering problem here. In this case, we will do something with you know zinc coated iron or steel whatever that is. Okay? But the technique that I will use that will treat this problem as if it is some kind of biological problem. It is not a biological problem. I will try to mimic a biological problem. I will try to treat it like a biological problem. I will try to solve it like a biological problem. Ultimately, I will solve a problem on steel. All right? That is the little unusual part of the type of work that I do and I am not alone. Trust me, there are many people like me all over the world now. Okay. Now, let us get here. What is the problem? Well, this is not my invention. Those of you who have taken a course on coating or maybe you know corrosion oxidation etcetera, you are aware of it. We are talking, we are looking at a coated, zinc coated steel. This is what I have written as iron. For convenience, we just neglected carbon here. Just say this is some iron and on top of it, there is a coating of zinc. All right. Now, this is not my invention. Those who deal with this thing, a lot of metallurgists have done a lot of experiments on this kind of systems. We all know now that the coated zinc is not exactly a homogeneous layer. If you look it under an electron microscope, you can very easily see there are several distinct phases. The major ones I have elaborated here, gamma, gamma 1, delta, zeta and on top of it 100 percent zinc which is eta. Got my point? 
So what is so new about it? Nothing new about it. Everybody knows it. It's a routine job for many industries. But I'll come back to it. But then before that, let me slowly move to this next slide. Then I'll come back to it. I normally do not like putting too many things on my slides. Okay, but this is the only one which the Americans call a busy slide. There is something for you to read. Read it. Okay, before you fall asleep. Okay. What we are talking about is very simple. Suppose I have some steel, it is coated with zinc using some kind of usual way. But the steel is for some kind of outside use, you will take it somewhere and it will be exposed to natural forces. And those natural forces will continuously put some kind of abrasion, you know, it has to suffer through a lot of wear and tear. What is going to happen, what happens to all the steel which is exposed outside, that those shear forces at some point will tend to break the coating, make it weak. And once you make it weak, there will be corrosion, the material might fail. What I am trying to do here, now you listen to me very carefully, because this is not something that you, I do not think you have thought that way. But that is the way many of us think all over the world now. The problem that I am trying to do here, that is I am trying to do in a very, very theoretical level, at least in this work, that let us design a zinc coated steel with the usual properties which you have seen there, which will fail, everything in the world has to fail at some condition, but it will fail, listen to me carefully, it will fail after maximum absorption of energy. That means I am shearing, shearing, shearing. At some point it fails, but before failing, it should absorb as much energy as possible. That means it is very strong. It does not like to fail too much. That is my requirement number one. I also have a second requirement. The second requirement is that it will fail after absorbing maximum energy, but it will fail with minimum deformation. You understand? I want to design a coated steel which will fail after maximum energy absorption with minimum deformation. This is not what happens. Normally the trends will be opposite. If something absorbs lot of energy, it will have a lot of deformation. But I have two requirements which are conflicting. I want it to fail after a lot and lot of deformation. I do not want it to deform very much. When these two requirements are conflicting each other, that means if I try to make one better, other one becomes inferior. This becomes a class of mathematical problem which is very well defined, which is very well known nowadays. You will learn a little bit about it. This is known as Pareto optimal problem and you will see how we have handled this classical problem of zinc coated steel using this approach. That means we are talking about we are talking about a design still, artificially designed still for various input conditions, which is very strong, perhaps the best possible design to fail at a very high level of shear force. Okay, that is the only type of force we are considering here, but it will not still not deform very much and that means that is the best possible design you can think of. Now, let me go back to the previous side slide for one minute. Now, the question is if we apply a shear force, normally the shear force acts here on the top surface, but the remember there are several interfaces. So, this force will slowly induce some kind of shear forces here, 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 here and since the material properties of all these phases are different, the level of shear here, level of shear there, level of shear there may not be the same. The question is, once I am talking about the best possible design of this material, which will fail after maximum energy and with a minimum deformation, 
that behavior has to be designed separately here, separately there, separately there and so on. That means all the interfaces have to be somehow examined, you know, differently. You understand? By the way, it is not forbidden to ask questions while I am talking, particularly your student. Treat it like a regular class, please. Okay? If you do not understand something, I will not be offended if you ask me a question or two. Please do that. Okay? Because I know these things, but if you know a little bit about it, that will make me very happy. Okay. So, what we will do? We will use those criteria in all the interfaces. So, we will find out out of this so many interfaces, which one is possibly the strongest one, which one offers the most protection, which one offers the least protection. You understand? Is the problem clear? All right. Now, let us proceed. So, this you have already read, I tried to tell you about. Now, let me tell you about the method that I am applying. This biological method that I have talked about, that can be coupled with lot of other well known conventional technique. In my own work, I quite routinely couple the, my methods of optimization, the biological optimization with more traditional techniques like say computational fluid dynamics, which is not used here. What I have used here is molecular dynamics of classical nature, which is being used by several of your professors in GIFT. They are aware of this technique. Okay, this is a very well established technique. Well, molecular dynamics can be done in many different ways. What I have done here is a, is a you can say an approximate engineering approach. I am not really considering the electrons here. I am just considering atoms and their interactions. And based upon those atomic interactions, the potential that acts between them, they generate certain forces which displaces the molecule and this interaction takes place over a time domain and ultimately there is some equilibrium con configuration where the assembly becomes stable. So, that is the molecular dynamics that I have done. Um, molecular dynamics is actually quite, quite time consuming, it takes a while. Although I am not considering the electronic interaction like some of your professors do here. So, my calculations are not as time consuming as some of those calculations, but still it takes a considerable amount of time provided if you talk about several thousands and thousands of atoms. Okay? So, what I do here, I create on the computer an artificial assembly of iron coated with zinc with all the phases that I talked about, creating those phases are not so difficult because there is enough information about their crystal structure, enough information about the many of other required properties. So, actually we can simulate that layer of coating that we have talked about. Now, classical molecular dynamics, that is what we are doing here, allows us to share that assembly and then see exactly how it moves how it fails and what happens to it after a while. We will do that. So, while we are doing that, there are these are the variables, you know, any metallic assembly will have a grain. So, grain size is a parameter that will vary from material to material. In our simulation, grain size varied. Grains could be at different orientation to each other and we can create those orientations. There are techniques of doing that. So, grain orientation varies. Velocity means the velocity at which the layer tries to move. Basically, that is a measure of the shear force that you are applying. And thickness is the how thick, how many atom layers are you coating. Okay? A thin layer and a thick layer, they may not fail in the same way. So, these are my system variables. I have to play with them to come up with certain combination of all those things, which will give me the optimum property of the steel that I am looking at. This by the way uh, is fully reported now three papers in computational material science and it was financially supported by you know uh, Indian, uh, Indian it actually it is not Indian, it is now international company Tata Steel, although their work is very much of a fundamental nature. 
Okay. We this is still theoretical, we have not really you know taken it to a you know real chunk of steel coated, it is still kind of theoretical investigation. But anyway, we have these variations and through MD simulation, the assemblies that I have talked about, I can share it, I can follow its energy absorption till it fails and when it fails, I can measure how much it has deformed that is the measurement of the strain and these are the parameters that I want all right and these parameters will uh, are the things that I need because I want this energy to be as large as possible and I want this strain to be as low as possible. But there is a problem I can run an optimization routine just using this molecular dynamics but the problem comes as I told you the molecular dynamics takes a very, very long amount of time. So, that is where my techniques come. Evo NN is one of my algorithms that I have perfected for several years now. First time we started developing it you will see that it uh, we are working on a problem with my collaborators in Finland on a blast furnace problem of the Rautru crystal company there you know while solving that we have we have evolved that uh, that particular computing method but the method does has, has nothing to do with blast furnace it is it is independent of the type of problem that's why you know even with uh, some of your friends here some of your collaborators here i i already started using it even at gift anyway in this particular problem that is what we are looking at, here we have coupled this technique the Evo NN technique with that molecular dynamics. Why did I do it? Because this Evo NN is an int intelligent software. If I do suppose I am trying to construct a model of this auditorium, well I can there is one way I can go to every chair and every table and model it and put them together and I get my whole auditorium that is very good that is very accurate, but that takes forever the same problem here. So, if I do molecular dynamics for the entire system for all the atoms for all the com you know then the calculations may go forever they will never finish. So, this technique allows me to do the following suppose what it does let us create this room analogy here I do some calculations there some there, some there, some there, then I put them together in a certain way through some kind of intelligence approximation, so that you get a total picture rather approximate, but reasonably accurate picture of this whole room. That is my software is doing here all right, that is where it comes into picture. So, once I get a model from energy, then I get the model for strain through this loop I evaluate them, then you will see this through one through our software of what you call the predator prey genetic algorithm, we optimize these two quantities all right. You may not be used to seeing those, but if you want to do something new in for the steel industry in a near future, you better look at it. Well, another thing is that although we are I still call it a toy problem, it is not a real problem because we really do not have that many atoms to represent say a piece of steel this big or something like that, but still we want to make it as realistic as possible all right. I can simulate a zinc coat over a piece of iron on the you know on the computer screen, I can create various phases on it, I can share it, but that is not the end of the story. Normal coated zinc will have the usual defects, it has got those dislocations ok that is something we also artificially induce in this system. That means, now I am ready with a kind of representation a toy model of a you know a coated steel which has defects, which has all the phases, which has the kind of realistic condition of you know sharing and failure all right. So, what I am doing here do not be uh, you know do not you should not find these things very very complicated. You put zinc over iron zinc means all the phases of zinc 
and then you have to make that assembly stable. Molecular dynamics cannot violate the laws of physics and so it creates some kind of ensemble. NPT is the total number of atoms or particles are constant and pressure and temperature are constant. Under this condition, you just basically at the atomic level, you go for a thermodynamic stabilization. So, now I have a still stable assembly and I can create for the stable assembly, I can create a polycrystal, I can create a single crystal. Let us skip all the details. Our last paper in computational material science actually gives you all the details for somebody who is interested, but take it from me. The assembly that I am coating, I can treat it like a single crystal, I can you know or I can treat it like a polycrystal containing grains of many different orientation that can be done. Okay? But that has to be stabilized, so I stabilized under NPT or NVE condition, N is number of particles, V is the volume and energy and then on that stable assembly, I put some limited tensile stress. What happens to a metal when you put it under tensile strain? Okay? Dislocations tend to move. All of you have done mechanical metallurgy? I am sure. Okay? All right. So, here we did not have any dislocations to begin with. What will happen? Through that, just by pulling it in a controlled way, I will just generate dislocations there. Now, I am ready. I am what I have? I have a zinc coated iron which has different phases, different layers which also has dislocation. Okay. Now, if I can share it, I am ready to go. Is it clear? The concept should not be difficult to anybody who has done some basic metallurgy earlier. That is very, very fundamental. Okay. Only thing that I am doing, I am trying to solve it's a, a kind of idealized version of a very common metallurgical problem. I could have given many other examples because we, you know, we apply it to many different things. But this is something is fundamental, very simple. That's why I have chosen it for today's lecture. Now this is what you are looking at. This is a one of the phases in zinc. As you can see, it has got many. This is the layer that is the thickness here. You can see we have created the grains and if you actually look it in 3D, the grains have you know different orientation. So, it is a polycrystalline assembly and equilibration means to start with, we have to assume that things are at thermodynamic equilibrium and molecular dynamics allows us to do that. We, we do it in a such a way, what you are looking at it is the most stable state of this particular thing. This of course, sits on top of something and that has got some other layers. We are just looking at one layer here. All right. Now, if I start pushing it from this side, that means if I start shearing it, this equilibrium will be distorted, atoms will move. Molecular dynamics allows us to catch that kind of thing at this level. And that information, my biological software catches, creates a model, then my second software optimizes it. That is the simple procedure. All right. What is next? This shows in that ideal thing, I put it with some limited tension. As you can see, some dislocation lines have been generated here and there. So, this is an ideal thing. It is not a perfect crystal. It is not so ideal. This is a coating with defect. I am trying to make it little more realistic. Okay. When Tata Steel gave me this project, maybe they were expecting that we will solve their, all their coating problems. Certainly, I am still far from that. But remember, to do anything meaningful for steel industry, these basic fundamental understandings are very, very important. Okay. I know this is not the real problem. Real problem is much more complicated, but I am trying to mimic that. I am trying to copy that. I am trying to understand that. I am trying to open some of the possibilities which might be there. All right. So, that means now I have been able to create some dislocation in here. Okay. This is the one of the layers. I do not know which one, but that is actually from some of our real simulations. You have one layer, you have another layer. As you can see, this is after 
you know providing some shear this layer has passed through it so that's why there is some deformation there is a thickness and there is a deformation okay you understand that that is how how much realistic simulation that you can do and that you can do for uh, every other layer in question now since this is there I can physically track every atom, find out where it was at the beginning, where it is now. I can actually measure this thickness and I can measure this deformation. How does it help it? Look at that. This is actually some real simulation for two of the phases and I can measure this thickness and I can measure this deformation. If I take the ratio, what I get is strength, as simple as that. So. I define a point of failure, at that point of failure if I measure this quantity, I can assume how much deformation has actually taken place when this material has actually failed. What is a failure? Well, that is a tough question to answer for a ductile material, all right, because you are not actually performing here something like a stress strain experiment or anything like that. What do I do? I have this, this is the lower layer, that is the upper layer which is moving. We do it in such a way when all the atoms have just crossed a distance more than, just more than one atomic, you know, you know, theoretical atomic distance of this zinc atom, okay. We assume after that it will just fell. So, at that point we are stopping the simulation, we are looking at the material, we are measuring thickness, we are measuring deformation and we, we say this is the strength at failure defined by us. Okay. We can keep on doing it if we do the simulation further ultimately you can literally see the atoms are just flying out. You do not want that, that does not happen in real life. Okay. So, we have to stop it at some point, examine that and look at it. All right. So, this is what we are doing. Um, this root mean square displacement is what our molecular dynamics uh, calculations can do. We can actually find out on the average because we are talking about every atom and atomic movement in molecular dynamics is kind of random. So, you have to have some average here. All right. You cannot say what is true for this atom that is exactly true for the next atom or you know somebody. So, we have to average that, that is very standard here. So, for this displacement as a number of time steps is physically you can take it as a measure of time during a simulation. We start here, atoms were not much displaced, then all of a sudden the sharp increase, the first one we can call it as a failure point and basically that is where you can see that and if we, we can also calculate during these simulations how much energy it is on the average it is the total energy that is absorbing. This energy at this point whatever that is that gives me the energy that it is absorbed before it failed according to my definition. Okay? And I will do this simulation over and over and over again. Actually in this case we have done it for something like uh, 100, 100, 110 times. And each time I will do it for different input combination, that means my shear velocity will be different, my grain size thickness will be different and so forth. So, I am trying to generate information like this room analogy. I do not need to simulate every chair here, but I am trying to simulate some of the crucial chairs here, so that I can put them together later on and construct a total model for the whole system. All right. So, that is how it is calculated at this point, the moment the slope changes here, I find out how much energy has been there, that is the energy that I have done for this system and so on and so forth. Now, anybody knows who this person is? It is not me. Anybody? Any guess? Those who are in my class, young you, this is Charles Darwin. Okay? <laughs> All right. Uh, well, Darwin does not know that today I am talking about him here at GIFT, but I am sure all of you know what Darwin did. Darwin was the biologist who told us about evolution in a scientific way for the first time. 
I am not a biologist. What I construct, I try to implement some of his principles in a very, very simple and crude way for solving problems related to say steel. Now, Darwin never imagined that I am sure. Okay. So, this is our genetic or the evolutionary way that pays homage to this man and also to somebody else later on, but not in a real biological way. I mean the way we are looking the failure of this, uh, this quoting is not exactly the same as how a human being evolves and ultimately dies, but we will try to look for some relation, some analogies, something similar. All right. Now, let us see what I am trying to do it. I got lot of information now on my energy as a function of several variables. I got lot of information on my strain as a number of variables. I do not want to perform molecular dynamic simulations all my life. It can go on from 100 years in my computers really. You have much faster machines here, but still it will not finish so easily. Okay? Uh, that is the problem. So, what I am trying to do, I get all my information and I want to come up with a model out of that information. As I told you many times today that I got information for some of the crucial chairs here, I am trying to get the inform a model which will generate all the chairs. But then the problem comes. The system that I am dealing with, the system that you deal with for most of your engineering work, most of your still related design work, you do not get the data that every point falls on a nice little straight line. If that happens, you do not need my method, it is too simple. What happens there that you get some noisy data, something like this, lot of fluctuation, lot of things which are not easy to predict, which are not easy to put into a model. What you do in a situation like that? The problem there, suppose this is from some of, I think is from one of my real simulation. These blue things are the real data. You can see the fluctuation and noise there. The red thing is my model which is trying to capture that. But you can see the red thing is not capturing everything in blue thing. Why it is doing that? Okay. In fact, if I try very hard, I am really hell bent upon it. I can basically create a red line so that you will not be able to see the blue lines. I do not do that. There is a reason why I do that, do not do that. I do not do that. You try to understand those who are either in deep meditation or half asleep uh, and those who are listening to me uh, that there is a reason why I only do this much, why I do not do that. That, sh that is applicable to any data set that you are trying to fit using any method, does not matter what that method is. I do not capture all the peaks and all the fluctuations because in this particular case my data is noisy. None of these points are actually accurate, they have some error and that error is not very systematic that I know everything is 10 percent more or 5 percent less, I cannot actually take it out. The error that I have made here and error that I have made there need not be the same. So, my data has got some random noise. So, if I try to fit everything there, then this is the thing. I get overfitting. That means, I capture every fluctuation, everything in my data. But the, in a process, I, I not only model the physical trend here, I also model the error, the random noise that is there. So, it looks very good for this particular data, but for the same system, if you try to apply that for another set of data, it will fail. So, that is the overfitting. I try to avoid that. There is another possibility, I am very conservating, I just draw a horizontal line through this data point. That is a model, but that is also equally bad model because that will not capture any of the real trends that I have in my system that will be underfitting. So, I am looking for, I am looking for a model which will neither overfit nor underfit and I claim that 
my red model has got some of the properties. That is the basic of my algorithms and how I do it. I have the system and for that system, I create a meta model. Meta model means I am trying to model a model that is called meta modeling. If I do that, I play with these two quantities. If I make my models more and more and more complex, okay, my model becomes more and more and more accurate. All right? But more and more and more complex and apparently more and more and more accurate models will tend towards the overfitting. Okay? So, I should not go for very high complex models. At the same time, I demand you know as much accuracy as possible in my model. Again, I am putting a conflicting order here. For this system, I am for which I have this blue data, I want a model that is as less complex as possible, okay? but that is as accurate as possible. If you think little carefully, you will see that is the restraint that I am asking for. A complex model becomes accurate and vice versa, but I do not want my model to be com uh, complex at the same time I want my model to be accurate. That means, again I am talking about to conflicting requirements and that is what I am trying to see what is the best possible kind of compromise here. So, this red model is actually a trade off between complexity and accuracy which shows well this much of complexity you can allow and that much of accuracy you can get beyond that you better not try to do because I, you will either overfit your data or you will underfit your data. All right? So, that is why this red model does not capture everything here, but it tries to capture the essential trends that is uh, that far you can go. All right? Just because you got 200 data points, your model does not matter what kind of model, need not be my model, maybe just an analytical model, it need not fit everything that you have in your experimental results. It will leave certain points out and your model is better if it does not try to fit anything and everything here that is the basic simple concept here. Now, let us talk about some of the fundamental things. Uh, I do not think you know this man, but to me of course, as you can see, uh, he is a little bit older than I am, you know, uh, but to me he is like some kind of God if I want to use that word in, in a very loose way, not in a religious sense. His name is Wilfredo Parito, very interesting person. During his era, he was perhaps one of the most talented mathematicians. Uh, he was uh, born in Italy in those days. His political views were very extreme and he created trouble for everybody. So, Italy got rid of him. So, he spent rest of his time in Switzerland and all the theory that I am applying here came from his mathematical work. Obviously, not only he does not know that I am in GIFT, but he also did not know that some point some engineers will be interested in his work. He even did not care much about his contemporary mathematics. He said he can use his mathematical principles to explain social phenomena. Okay. How much he explained that is a matter of still debate about the economist and you know social scientists who still follow him, but after that engineers and mathematicians have used him a lot including somebody like me uh, who use his principles a lot without going into mathematical details. I will skip this line, so do not be worried here, but let us talk about that. All right? Well, I was in United States when I was planning to come to GIFT, I got an invitation from Professor Lee, I got visa from Korean embassy. So, I was thinking about how I want to come here. So, I my choice of my travel plan was based upon two very important criteria. What are those? I wanted to reach here as quickly as possible and I wanted to spend as little as possible. So, as you can see, 
I am trying to play with two quantities here. Cost of my travel, I want to minimize it and my time of my travel, I also want to minimize it. But the problem is the real world, world you know, works in a different way. If you want to come fast, you should be prepared to prepare to spare, pay more. Okay? And if you do not pay enough or pay a lot of money, you should not reach here very quick. So, in a situation, this is of course an hypothetical example, if you play with all your options, then Pareto using his mathematics, which I am not going to talk about here, he will tell you, you may have thousands and thousands of options, that means thousands, hundreds of airlines flights, maybe too many car companies and maybe some bicycle companies too. Out of them, these three are your best options. That means, it is not possible for you to find an airplane company or carrier or route which will be better than this one or better than this one and better than that one. And what is better, what is not better for that he has got some simple mathematical uh, definitions. Let us not talk about that. But that is the advantage here. Think about any industry or any industrial problem where you can, where you can minimize two conflicting criteria simultaneously. What are your choices? What are your options? That is what I get through this kind of analysis of Pareto optimality. That means, you know, I want to find out a cheapest possible transport, transportation that would bring me somewhere at the minimum possible time. There may be thousands of options. Out of that, I can select few of them, like I have just, you know, kind of schematically done here, which are my best, that is the optimum. And for design problems, industry prefers that, because Pareto tells us here, this plane, this car and this bicycle, all of them as far as is concerned an optimum solution, whether you take this or that or that, that choice is yours. That means, forget about this problem, when it comes to a real hardcore problem for industry, I offer industry more than one optimum solution, then industry can compare whether this optimum is better, that is better or that is better. That option, that flexibility now making Pareto optimality as an enormously effective design tools. Just do a Google search on this kind of things, you will see how many thousands of references are there, how many people are actually working on this kind of thing. What Pareto said? If I take this airplane, my cost has to cost has to be more, my time will be shorter. And if I take the bicycle, my cost will be very less, but my time would be longer. There is no possible way you can have a trade of a, a, another plane or another bicycle which will bring you at a lower time and at a lower cost. That that makes this three optimum. So, this principle will be followed throughout. I, I, these are the two of my algorithms, EVO and N. Another one is by objective genetic programming. We call that BioGP. We will, I will talk about them uh, slowly in a sketchy way. Now, this optimization between accuracy and complexity. How I do that? I use an algorithm called a predator prey genetic algorithm. What happens here? I play a game here. What kind of game? In a computational space, which I can see that is created, I simply produce two types of species, one is there, another one is there. Analogically, this is your predator and this is your prey. For your problem, the prey is a set of possible solutions. Okay? And predator is a some kind of entity that we can construct mathematically whose job is to kill them. But it cannot kill anybody and everybody. There are certain hunting rules for this lion. For example, it can kill only in a neighborhood like that and neighborhood has a specific definition here. And in this neighborhood, if there are suppose several of this deer, it cannot kill just anyone. It has to look for some weakness in the deer. And 
Not only that, this deer population can get killed by this lion, but it can also increase because of birth of you know more fawns and you know through the usual process of uh, reproduction. So, if I start playing this game in this domain, it has got several other properties. Let us not bother about that. Those who are taking my class, certainly I will teach them all the details. Uh, what happens there? After some generation, you come up with a family of this deer, which no lion can kill if it is a fair game. What are those? Those are, if I go back to the previous slide, those are your optimum solutions. That is how I evolved them. Okay? And to get that, what I am doing? I am following something that happens in a nature. I am following a biological principle, but I am not doing any biology here. Okay? So, this is the thing. All right? So, what are the things now? Let us start reading a little bit of the slides. Predator cannot kill everybody. It kills the weakest neighbor. Both the predator and prey, if they are in just one place, then this thing does not move. We allow them to move here in this lattice following certain rules. And we do not allow them to simply annihilate everybody. We take it to a level that we always try to maintain a target ratio, a desirable ratio between these two quantities. If everybody is killed, there is no solution, there is no optimization for me, right? I, and if nobody is killed, no optimization for me either. So, I have to play with those things a little bit. Now, this game I am trying to, trying to play on a traditional neural net, but do not ever think my technique is actually a neural net. Because wh why it is different? Because instead of unlike the traditional neural net, which some of you I know here are familiar with, neural net creates and model between some inputs and outputs using you know this kind of inputs, this kind of weights, connections, neurons and through that there are some other layers. Here what I do, I take a family of neural nets as and those neural nets are actually my deer. Okay? Those neural nets can be killed by some lions, they have certain definitions here but they can also reproduce. Here you can see in my method a typical neural net is mating with another neural net and these are the two children which are born. So, that offers my neural net an enormous flexibility and it makes my neural net not to require what you call the conventional training algorithms like back propagation etcetera, which I do not use here to evolve it ultimately. And this is how our first algorithm was born. Uh, Frank Peterson and Henrik Saxon, they are perhaps my most trusted collaborators in Finland. With them, some years ago, uh, this got published in Applied Subcomputing, I think the year is in 19, 2007. We did this work around 2005. As I told you, the first algorithm was based upon, based upon some studies on the blast furnace of the Finnish steel company Rauturuki. They were doing a lot of injection in their blast furnace, but problem was that during those injection, the hot metal that they were producing, the silicon, sulfur and carbon levels were just fluctuating like crazy and that is expected. So, we wanted to come up with some kind of optimum conditions which would, which would uh, give them kind of steady values of these three very usual quantities in the hot metal and the variables that we have considered here, how much ash you have, what size of the injection particle, you know, coke strength alkali, how much oil you are injecting, so on and so forth, it's traditional blast furnace things, conventional problems. Okay? But to do that, I have developed this new algorithm. It was a semester in Finland and I preferred that to be in winter and in winter Finland becomes very cold. Okay? One night, I just could not sleep much, I was thinking about what to do. Uh, then, you know, I got some of these ideas, I was not too sure that if it will work or not just uh, kind of sleepless next morning I you know I just stood in front of Frank Peterson's office he's a very good friend anyway he was not arrived when he arrived 
I just said, Frank, I have got this idea. Do you think it will work? He said, let's give it a try. And rest of it, you can see it. Yes, it worked. This is one of our, our first trials for these problems. That's where everything has begun. We used 30 predators, 30 lions, 200 preys, 200 deer or 200 neural nets, and made them to evolve. And we are trying to work out a trade-off between the training error and number of weights. Number of weights measures the complexity here. So each of these diamonds that you see here is a potential neural net. And using the criteria of you know, Wilfredo Pareto, the man you have seen just one or two slides back, these are the optimum models. All right? So uh, all right. If you have any questions, please ask. Okay? Um, I'm very sorry to say that. Uh, you know, seeing few slipping faces from this side, it, it's not a very pretty sight sometimes. Okay? So, anyway, so what happens here? Each of them is a model. Each of them, if I take them here in this case, will generate a model for silicon, sulfur, and carbon in the hot metal as a function of this function of this input quantities. Each model will give you a different level of accuracy and different level of complexity. All right? In those days, we did not know out of this so many models which you want to pick. If I pick something here and something there and something there, performance will be different. Nowadays, after several generations of my students and my collaborators, we made it a little more mathematically or statistically meaningful. Out of those, out of those possible optimum models, we can now select one based upon some complexity analysis. And these are, let's not bother about the details here. These are some well-established statistical criteria that can allow us to compare and evaluate these models and ultimately point out to maybe this one or that one. And this is called Akaike criteria. This is called corrected Akaike criteria and this is called the Bayesian information criteria. You can use those kind of analysis to pick up out of all these options just one. All right? Now, this is for some real system. I believe that time I was, uh, this uh, thing came when I was simulating something for the Tata Blast furnace is one of them anyway. Uh, so, what happened? We have created so many models for the blast furnace. This, all of them are according, you know, kind of optimum model, but using this mathematical analysis, this one was picked up. That is what I reported to Tata. Okay. So now there is. I still have. When I'm supposed to finish? Uh, less than five minutes. Yes, I can do that. All right. There are lot of. There are, lot of. Other options available. Lot of details are there. And certainly what I am going to teach in one semester, I cannot finish it in one hour. But just to give you a glimpse of it, I have a family of a second level of algorithms. The first one that I have given here that is best upon neural networks. Problem with neural network, neural network really cannot construct a mathematical, mathematical formula for you. So my latest algorithm, as you can see, these are quite new. Okay. Uh, the Bridges Giri, my bachelor's and master's research assistant, who basically wrote most of the source code, uh, is not with me. I expected him to do a PhD, but one fine morning he said that American Express hired him for doing the encryption software. I said, well, I can't compete with American Express. They're a bit too big for me. Anyway, but he's a metallurgist, by the way, just like any one of you. But what we have done here we used another technique called genetic programming. Genetic programming looks at the same problem like a tree, but the output that I have here is actually a mathematical function. So I actually have a physical model which you can write on a piece of paper and calculate. That is the only difference here. A simple example that I am here, what I have evolved here is some omega multiplied by x cube, something multiplied by x square, something there and plus some theta. So that means for some system, this is the model. This may not be the model for real system. That happens here. 
So, what happens here? These trees actually evolve. This one tree, two tree, and the three I am evolving here. They evolve using biological principles. You know, after that, we aggregate them and do few other techniques here. Uh, so, again, the basic principle is the same or rather similar. Again, I am trying to work out a trade off between accuracy and complexity, etcetera. Et As you can see, I will just now go over a little quickly that I can use mathematical functions like log, sine, you know, multiplication, etc. I do crossover, I do mutation, forget about it. Let us skip some of those things. Now, let us come back to our old problem. Okay. Uh, this is actual results from one of our papers. We have generated many solutions, many stable solutions, many optimum solutions and we found out that most of the strongest solutions are possible to get at that zeta eta interface. Now, I have to go back to the very beginning of the thing, okay. uh, still a little far, okay. sorry for that. Uh, where is your zeta eta, the top layer? All right. According to my calculation, best possible strongest idealized, idealized strongest coatings can be you know obtained here. In, according to my calculation, you know maximum protection of a coated zinc, uh, you know zinc coated steel comes at the topmost layer, which is 94 percent zinc and 100 percent zinc. All right. But fortunately, I am not the only person who looked in the system. There are hundreds and hundreds of people who have studied this experimentally. So, I looked for experimental evidence and I was real surprised. I, you know, me and my students, we almost jumped. This is exactly what the literature says. The top layer is the strongest one. If, you f if anything fails, everything else fails. So, that means the toy problem that I have solved, which is not really actually realistic, it is an approximation with which requires lot of scale up, lot of other things actually makes sense and that is all you get when you try something different, something you think out of the box, you do not think like others and you try to absorb information uh, that is available in other disciplines. If you think just reading metallurgy books will do you everything, no need not be. You may have to learn something a little bit interdisciplinary. Well, as you can see, I told you 2009, 2011 and 2012, we have published some series of papers in computational material science where this work is uh, discussed. My techniques are discussed in those journals and that is about it. Thank you so much. Any questions? Yeah, please. Yeah, I'm not familiar with those. No, you don't have to be familiar. Nobody has to be familiar. It is optimization of certain properties. And optimization people well. I, I can do optimization even manually. I look into, suppose I am looking for, you know, I am in the market next door and I am looking for some apple which is good. I physically examine them and find out one that looks nice, which is not rotten and which is also according to my budget cheap. That is the optimized apple. In that sense, that is you have done purely manually. What we have done here? In principle, not so much different from that procedure, but lot of computation, lot of effort has gone into it. That is the only difference. And since optimization is a mathematical discipline, there is always a justification, theoretical justification, why you are doing it, why something that results that you got, whether that makes some sense or not. That is all we have done here. 
Okay. Any other? Okay. Yes, please. Uh, Holly. Yeah, yeah. One of the slides you had uh, several optimal solutions. Yes. And uh, you, of course, you didn't explain, but you have some uh, reason to choose one optimum solution. Yes. But what could be the difference between the range of the optimal solutions? I mean, what, will they be drastically different with each other? Yes, they could be. The whole, pr since you are, I understood your question. You can, you, you can sit down here. Since you are, I would say, quite religiously attending my classes, you'll pretty soon come to know about the details here. The first thing that normal optimization is that I have this function, I want this. That's what I'm doing in class till very recently, okay? But this Pareto optimization is a little different from that. Pareto says there's no unique optimum solutions. I have thousands of options. There are thousands of apples. But Pareto says, okay, only these hundreds are the best. Out of that, you choose one. Yes, they will vary in terms of their desired properties from one to another. But if Pareto says, in this market, out of 1,000 apples, these 100 are the optimum apples. From remaining 900, you cannot find an apple which is better than this 100 that he has chosen. That is the thing. So, I have not started that in class. That's why this concept is very alien. But I'm sure those of you who are there, give me another couple of weeks, we'll master it like not like Pareto maybe, but at least like me. Okay, so that's where it is. Optimum is not unique here. Okay, uh, let me ask you a question. Please. Uh, there is uh, some kind of uh, artificial neural network yes. uh, algorithm, yeah. but is it different from, uh, it, it, your uh, yes. method is yes. different from yes. that? Yes, what I'm doing, normal, uh, of course, uh, you know, Certainly, a, uh, you know, a seminar is not the, doesn't give me the enough time to explain all the details, which obviously I'm going to do in my class. That, that's why it runs for one semester. Uh, what happens, normal neural nets, uh, the standard ones, you give a lot of training set of data, your inputs, and that creates, using this kind of uh, thing, it creates an, creates an output. And you use some kind of training algorithms externals, you know, uh, back propagation algorithm, for example, one which is very common, which ultimately gives you a combination, the architecture of that net, which uh, gives you the ideal value for your inputs and hopefully that you can use that model there. I am also trying to, in my two algorithms, in first one I am also trying to generate a neural net, but not using this training method. I have a problem, I have some data, I have some information available. I just randomly generate various types of random neural nets. Some of them are good and some of them are bad. All of them try to solve the same problem. Okay. Instead of training them, I let them run uh, through my data and find out how much error they, they, are, they do. And those who are taking my class, they know this is the approach of genetic algorithm where those which perform little better, they survive little more. So little better neural nets will survive more. Then I treat them, two neural nets, as, as if they're biological parents, out of them two children neural nets are born. I look at their performance. So that's how ultimately I come up with a family of neural nets. Beyond that I cannot go. And that is supposed to be the ideal model of your system, which will not overfit your data, at least theoretically, not under feet of data. That means it is the right, uh, right kind of. Okay. Model. Then, anyway, uh, yeah. in those uh, uh, case, yeah. uh, you need a lot of data. Uh, not right? a lot, really. If you have too much, it depends on your problem. For example, here, this calculation, I wish I could do more, but our computers were about to give up. As I'm telling you, I come from India's so-called finance institution, but my computation facilities are far inferior than what you have here, okay? So when you reached about 100 simulations, my students said, uh, we better stop, because if you continue to do that, uh, at least I may not be able to graduate. I could see the point there. So with 100 data points, 
we could do this and as you can see given the, all the limitations, all the complexities actually we could basically generate the trend which experimentalists know anyway. For an experimental work where you do not need this kind of experimental 100 points or 200 points not such a big deal that you can generate and we do that. But when I did one thing before I do that, I have solved blast furnace problems many, many times. You know, at one point Americans tried to make me an extra metallurgist, extra, that too experimental kind. So I understand those things a little bit, I feel a little comfortable there. So the, I worked several times on Indian blast furnaces of various companies, Shell and Tata Steel and also the Finnish blast furnace companies. But there, something which is as complicated, as noisy, as difficult as blast furnace. Suppose if I want to see how that blast furnace will behave another three months from today, I need at least one year's history. So there the requirement of data is much more. Okay? Okay. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you again.